This morning, we are going forward in the book of Acts, and we're opening up to chapter 7, verses 1 through 16, where we're going to hear Stephen give a defense before the Sanhedrin, and he's going to retell part of Israel's history. And our purpose today is to look into it to see how Stephen's defense not only confirms the case that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, but also how God is using that, specifically through the story of Joseph, which we'll focus on retelling this morning as well. So I want to invite you to find a Bible and open it up to uh, Acts chapter 7. If you're using one of our worship Bibles, that can be found on page 914. And please stand as together we honor the Word of God as I read it and we give it our attention. These are the words of the living and the true God. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from the land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. He gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, even though he had no child. God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others and who would enslave them and inflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham became the father of Isaac, And circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob. And Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him. And rescued him out of his afflictions. And gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all of Egypt and Canaan. And great affliction. And our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died. He and our fathers And were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Lord, as we come to this text this morning, we pray that you'd open our eyes to see how this applies to us. This ancient story, what is its purpose? What is its meaning? What is its significance? Open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, I want to begin with a question this morning, and the question is this. Do you trust that God is in control of your life and this world? Do you trust him? That trust is tested greatly sometimes when bad news or difficult circumstances come into our lives. Soren Kierkegaard once wrote, Life must be lived forward but it can only be understood backwards. A wise old Chinese man uh, living on the troubled Mongolian border, one day his horse jumped over the fence and ran away and was captured by enemies. All his friends came around and said, oh, that's bad news. We're sorry for you. And he said, well, how do you know that it's bad news? It might be good news. The following week, that horse that ran away returned riding next to and riding, running with a beautiful stallion. And they just jumped right back into his pen. And the neighbors came by and said, wow, this is such wonderful, good news. And the wise old man said, how do you know whether this is good news or bad news? His son decided to ride that stallion and was thrown from it in a great upheaval and fell and broke his leg. And the neighbors came by and said, oh, we're so sorry for your bad news. He said, well, how do you know it's bad news? 
it might be good news. A month later, war broke out, and all the Chinese uh, captains came, and they recruited soldiers to go fight against the Mongolians. In the end, all of those sons of the entire village died, except the one whose leg was broken by that horse. He alone survived. The man said, the things you considered good were actually bad. And the things you considered bad were actually good. Consider the poem by Hudson Taylor. Ill that God blesses is our good. Did you hear that? Ill that God blesses is our good. And unblessed good is ill. And all is right that seems most wrong, if it be his sweet will. Today we are looking at the providence of God. God's upholding and governing all things. That's why I asked the question, do you trust God? It comes to us in the story of Joseph, found here in this lengthy defense by Stephen that Luke records here in the book of Acts. And so we're kind of pausing in this middle of the story of Acts to look at the story within the story, as it were. We met Stephen last week, of course. We saw that he did good works publicly. He spoke the truth wisely. He faced his uh, false witnesses graciously. He was arrested and put on trial by false witnesses who said that this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place, that is the temple, and the law. And so this passage is the beginning opening of Stephen's defense. And what he's going to do is he's going to retell the story of Israel from the beginning and see if the story retold through the lens of a Christian doesn't make more sense in the end than the story that's told by the Pharisees. And through it, we see the hand of God's providence in the story of Joseph. Stephen is going to survey this over 50 plus verses, and we're going to break it down this week and next and the week after to kind of go through this story slowly. This week, we see the providence of God from Abraham to Joseph, and next week, we're going to look at the rebellions of Israel together, so don't miss that one. It's going to be a ride. So first of all, though, before we go any further, let's just answer this question, what is providence? It's a word we know of Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, We might use the word providence from time to time, but not in our typical speech, I would guess. You probably don't uh, talk to your friends and say, wow, how's the stock market going in my life? Well, it's okay. It's been pretty good providence lately, or bad providence in the stock market. We don't use the word providence very much, but it's a very biblical word that has a very specific meaning, and so let's define it. Basically put, providence, what we mean by this is God's most holy, wise, and good, upholding and governing all things. As we read scripture, we see that God takes credit for much more than we first imagined. He even takes credit for making wise plans out of evil deeds, like we're seeing in the story of Joseph. Uh, The Westminster Catechism, uh, question number 11, helps us by answering the question this way. God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. Consider just a few verses from the scriptures this morning. Psalm 103, verse 19 says this. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His kingdom rules over most of it. Oh, wait, no, I read that wrong. His kingdom rules over all. Psalm, I was just making sure you're paying attention this morning. Psalm 33 says this, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says this, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Wow. Did you realize all the leaders of all the nations of all the world, all the kings, their their desires and their choices are affected by the sovereign purposes of God? He takes credit for that. He takes credit for big things and small things. Not a sparrow can fall apart from your father, says Jesus in Matthew 10, verse 30. We learn in Acts 17, where Paul is speaking at the Areopagus, that 
God appoints the places where men will live. There are appointed times and boundaries and places so that they may seek him, though he's not very far from every one of us. So God is ruling over all things, including kings and sparrows, people, and events. This becomes a difficult teaching at times because now we have to wrestle with the hard things that happen in life. If God's in control of all those things, then why are these things happening to me? As we live our lives forward, we often don't understand what's happening. So let's look at this text uh, briefly here with Abraham and then take a little bit more time with Joseph this morning. First of all, in the first uh, eight verses of Stephen's defense, we see providence building. And think about what God does as he calls Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees and brings him to the land which he will show him. See, here in Genesis 12, back in the first book of the Bible, God is doing a new thing following several severe judgments against the rebellions of humanity, starting with Adam and Eve. We have the fall of Adam and Eve, and they get kicked out of the garden. God is so frustrated with mankind that he washes them away in the flood and only preserves Noah together with his family. And then after that, they decide to build a tower, going to use a lot of technology to make a name for themselves, and God confuses the languages and spreads them out across the face of the earth. So God is at work to judge repeatedly, and in Genesis chapter 12, though, something new happens. God's desire is to reach the world and reclaim his people, reclaim the world for his governance and for his glory, that he might be praised and worshiped by all the nations. And so he starts with one man named Abraham. And he calls Abraham and he gives him these things. In verses three and four, we see, he tells him, go to the land I will show you. He gives him a command to obey. And Abraham obeys that command and goes the rest of the distance after his forefather, uh, Terah, had stopped at Haran. And he gives him a promise to believe that he will give Abraham the land and to his offspring. And he doesn't even have any kids yet. And he's old. So his chances of having kids are like really small, except for God. Then God gives him a prediction of the future. God tells Abraham, listen, 400 years are going to pass. Your descendants are going to be led away out of the land I've promised you. And they're going to end up in Egypt and they're going to be treated harshly, but I'm going to be with them and deliver them and bring them back into this land and they'll worship me yet again. That is an amazing statement of God's providence, isn't it? And the story of Joseph begins to set it up by explaining how Abraham's descendants actually came to Egypt where they would be enslaved. And to seal it all up, God gives Abraham the covenant. He says, this is the covenant. All of your male children shall be circumcised on the eighth day as a sign and seal of my promises to you and your children after you that I will do what I have said. So here as we read the story from Genesis 12 up through the middle to the end of Genesis, we see God is telling us the future, what he's going to do. He tells Abraham, and the books of Genesis, Exodus, and beyond are the unfolding of that plan which God said he would do. This is the first aspect of the providence providence of God, his calling, his promising, his planning. And see, God can make and keep promises into the future because he stands outside of time. He rules over time and eternity. For him, he doesn't have to live it forward and see what's going to happen and then look backward. He's there over all of time and knows the affairs and the will and the evil and the good of mankind. And when he says he will do something, he will accomplish his purpose. My purpose will stand, says the Lord God Almighty. This is our God. He's not like a man. (laughs) He's totally different. That's why we sing, all cry out, sing holy forever, a holy God. This is what it means for him to be holy. He's other than us. We don't just extrapolate the best person and say, God's kind of like the best father ever. Oh no. God is amazing and he's kind of like a father, but he's a lot more than a father. Amen? So here we've seen Providence building as Stephen recounts the history of Israel And now he's going to tell us how providence is on display in the story of Joseph. So let's just walk through the story of Joseph. Do you you know or do you remember the story of Joseph? It's an amazing story. And right in the middle of it, I think all the the Twitter sphere was going out. Like uh, that guy, Joseph, you know, he's in jail again. Uh, Let's put our hope in somebody else somewhere else. 
See, the story of Joseph is in the end of Genesis. It's the means by which God is going to bring the family of Jacob, Israel, to dwell in the land where they will be enslaved. And it may be one of the greatest comeback stories of the entire Old Testament. Job and jo- Joseph are kind of in there for the, the biggest comebacks, okay? Uh, I was reading John Piper's most recent book. It's like 800 pages. It's on Providence. It's amazing. I'd highly recommend it. But he says this, the story of God's rescue of his chosen people from starvation, Genesis 47, by the means of the enslavement of Joseph through the sins of his brothers contains one of the most important statements in all the Bible about the providence of God. The statement is made by Joseph to his brothers near the end of the story. Here's the plot spoiler, okay? As for you, Joseph says to his brothers after their father has died, and they're afraid that Joseph's not going to turn on them now. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, the saving of many lives. Whoa. So let's walk through the story. You meant this for evil against me. Consider for a moment the human sins at work in the first pages of Joseph's story. His father, Jacob, has two wives and two concubines and 11 sons. Talk about a messed up family. If you ever feel like you had a messed up family, just go back and read the Bible. It's really reassuring. (laughs) And Jacob loves one of his wives better because there's the one that he loved and then she didn't have children and then she finally does and it's Joseph. So Jacob just dotes on Joseph. He gives him a special coat of many colors. You may have heard that part. And Joseph's like, hey guys, what's up? And they're like, we hate you. (laughs) And Joseph then, uh, you know, there's these sins at work, right? And Joseph is an an antagonist, right? He has these dreams. He's like, hey guys, I had this dream, you know, like I was this sheaf of wheat and you guys are like sheaves of wheat and you're all bowing down to me. And they're like, "Mm," they're grinding their teeth, right? And so they're angry and they're, they're, they're jealous, right? And they're so jealous that they hatch a murderous plot against their brother. It's only because one of the brothers, I think it's Reuben, steps in and says, hey guys, let's not do that. We, we can just put him in a pit and the brother's like, I'll come back and get Joseph and we'll, we'll work this thing out. But instead, due to their greed, the story goes on that they sell Joseph into slavery to some Ishmaelites who are coming by that day by God's providence. And then they lie to Jacob about Joseph's death. They take the coat of many colors back, spilled with blood, and say, Dad, we don't know what happened. Big lie. An animal must have gotten your most beloved son, and we're sorry. And so we see Joseph's plight. Let's follow Joseph for a moment here. Joseph's master, as he's sold into slavery, is a man named Potiphar. Potiphar, you hear, almost hear the word Pharaoh in Potiphar, Pharaoh. And he's, he's faithful in, in Potiphar's house so well that Potiphar makes him like the chief guy of all the other slaves. But then Potiphar's wife kind of finds Joseph attractive and she tries to seduce Joseph and kind of pull him into her room. Joseph is righteous and doesn't do it he resists temptation, and then what happens next? She flips the script and tells Potiphar, this guy you brought into our household, he just tried to rape me. And Joseph goes to prison. So now he's a slave, and now he's imprisoned. Can't get any worse, right? He goes from servant to prisoner. He, I, I just pause for a moment and feel Joseph's pain, right? He's seen his, bro- his brothers in 13 years. He doesn't know if his father is alive anymore. Every single one of his earthly brothers hated him. He doesn't even know that he's got another brother who's been born. He must feel all alone. He must feel disappointed with God. He must be wondering, Lord, what happened to those dreams you gave me? Were they just my own imagination? He must have been tempted to be angry with God and God's plan. He's 500 miles from the promised land, abandoned, forsaken, rejected, forgotten. 
Joseph even interpreted the dreams of two men that were there in the prison with him, one a baker and one a cupbearer. Remember the story of the baker? The baker was going to be uh, hung because he was unrighteous and he deserved to be in prison. And Joseph predicts that and the baker dies. And he talks to the cupbearer and says, oh no, you're God's favor is with you. You're good and Pharaoh's going to like you. You're going to be restored to your position. And lo and behold, the cupbearer is restored to his position. But does the cupbearer remember to speak about Joseph? No, he forgets again. Joseph, abandoned, forgotten, 13 dark, long years Then one night, Pharaoh has a dream. Dream of seven big fat cows being eaten by seven scrawny little anemic cows. Lo and behold, somehow the cupbearer remembers Joseph and Joseph is brought in to interpret the dream. And he interprets that dream to mean seven good years followed by seven years of famine and that uh, Pharaoh better start making plans immediately as in yesterday to store up all the grain because there's going to be a famine over the entire known world. And what happens? The rejected Joseph is restored to power. Not just restored to power, but exalted, higher than he ever was before. Pharaoh makes him second in command over all his kingdom. There's nothing that's held back from Joseph. He has all authority in Egypt under Pharaoh. Meanwhile, the brothers, remember them, have experienced this famine. And Jacob, their father, is like, hey, I've heard that there's some bread down there in Egypt. Can you guys just go down there, buy some, and come on back? You have to read the whole rest of Genesis there to kind of hear the intricate parts of the story, but we'll fast forward to this singular point of what happens here is that this exalted brother is now the means of God's salvation of his own kindred, all 75 persons. Because of their rejection of him, God was working his purpose that it might stand to save the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, from dying in the land of Canaan and brings them down into Egypt. And Stephen in giving his defense, brings all of his hearers who know this story like you and I know every other thing we binge watch on Netflix, they they live in this story. And he tells them the story for a very specific purpose. So let's look here as we close, how does this tie back into Stephen? You see, God's providence is on display not only in Joseph, but also in the parallels between Jesus and Joseph. Let's think this through for a minute. God's providence there is on display. Who is Jesus in the story of Israel? Jesus comes to his own, but his own received him not. What did the brethren, the brothers of Jesus do? They sell him for 30 pieces of silver. They condemn him to death. They hated him. And yet, what does God do? (laughs) God exalts Jesus by raising him from the dead and seats him at the royal seat of power, second in command under God the Father over all rule and authority and power, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you see the parallel? It's pretty wide open right there when you read it in context of Stephen talking about Jesus and being asked, what do you believe about this holy place and this law that we all believe in? And Stephen says, oh yeah, I believe it. I believe it so much that everything that's in this book points to Jesus as the fulfillment and the Savior and the Lord whom you meant for evil, God meant for good. You meant to kill the author of life and God meant to save you from death. This is our God, and I believe in him, and I believe that you ought to repent really fast because you meant this for evil, and right now you need forgiveness. What an amazing story. Here, what is Stephen doing? But he's recounting the story of the Bible faithfully. He's condemning the false witnesses as evil brothers, and he's offering the grace of Jesus all over again. This is the grace of God found in providence, that if it were not for the providence of God, we could not be certain that God could deliver his good grace. But because he rules and governs over all things with wisdom and love, he can and he does save you and me. And we can count on it. 
Just as surely as Abraham could count the stars in the sky and know that God would be faithful. Just as much as Joseph's dreams would prevail and sure enough, his brothers would bow down and they did. Just as surely as God said, I will, save my one, I will send my one and only son to save the world because I love the world, we can count on his promises to be good and faithful and true and fulfilled for our good and for his glory. Isn't that good news? And Stephen wants these people to know, yes, he believes the story. Yes, they're on the wrong side. But yes, they can get on the right side of God because what they meant for evil, God means for good. And that good is the saving of you and me. This is the story of Jesus. So let me close by asking you this question. Do you know Jesus as your savior? Have you come to this place of seeing that he is the one who has been exalted to the right hand of the father, that he and only he can save you, that what your intentions as oft times good intentions as they may have been were actually often things that were evil, but yet God can use for good, even to save you. Do you, do you know this Jesus that gave his life, that when the evil forces and evil powers surrounded him, he used those to defeat them by dying and defeating death by dying the death Amen. and raise, rising again that we might know him forever. Do you know this Jesus? I, I hope you do. I hope you've come to a place of saying, Lord Jesus, thank you that you conquer even over my own sin and you rule and reign with your providence to save me and make me one of your own. Romans 8.28 says this, we know that for those who love God, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, all things work together for good. Even those difficult things, if you're struggling like you, like, like uh, Joseph was there in that pit, down in the prison, at the bottom, take heart. God is using these things. We just heard that song, New Wine, right? In the crushing, in the breaking, you are making new wine. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the greater Joseph. Thank you that you endure the humiliation and rejection of your brothers, that you might redeem and through your exaltation, save the world. And Lord, we rejoice and exult in your strength and wisdom and goodness and love and grace. And we thank you for it. And I pray if there's anyone here this morning that's, that's unsure about how loving you are, that they would know that through Jesus, the full display of your love has been made known. And that by putting their trust in you and in you alone, they can come into your favor. That any ill they face by you might be blessed and become good. Thank you, Lord, for your sovereign salvation, your glorious goodness, and your everlasting love. In Jesus' name, amen.